order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Tom Tugendhat. Question one, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure that members across the whole House will wish to join me in congratulating Her Majesty the Queen and Prince Philip on their upcoming platinum wedding anniversary this coming Monday. They have devoted their lives to the service of our country, and I know know the whole House will wish to offer them our very best wishes on this special occasion. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Tom Tugendhat. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend, stewardship of the economy and her predecessor's excellent work in making sure this economy grows has seen confidence in our country grow despite the troubles and tribulations that have been set before us. Our debts have now come, our deficit has now come down and our debts are oversubscribed. Will she take this opportunity to invest in our economy even more than she has already and perhaps even take the chance to build more homes? My honourable friend makes a very Prime Minister. My honourable friend makes a very important point about investing in infrastructure, and he refers to uh, to housing particularly. But we are doing exactly that. I mean, that's why we've seen over a quarter of a trillion pounds in infrastructure spending since 2010. We're putting in another uh, 22 billion from central government for economic infrastructure. Uh, We're seeing billions of pounds on rail projects, the biggest road building programme ever for a generation. That's this country, this government, building a country fit for the future. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in wishing Her Majesty and Prince Philip a very happy platinum wedding anniversary. Mr Speaker, the thoughts of the whole House will be with the victims of the devastating earthquake that hit Iran and Iraq on Monday, leaving hundreds dead and thousands without shelter. I hope the Government is offering all necessary emergency help and support that can be used to save life. I also hope, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure the House will join me in sending our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of the late Carl Sargent, the Labour Assembly member in Wales, who very tragically died last week. Mr Speaker, crime is up, violent crime is up, and police numbers are down by 20,000. Will the Prime Minister urge her Chancellor, who I note this week is sitting absolutely next to her, so it will be easy for her to make this demand on him, to provide the funding our police need to make communities safe? Prime Minister. Well, uh, first of all, can I say to the Right Honourable, he raised three points there. First of all, on the earthquake that took place in Iraq and Iran, we are monitoring this closely. It's a devastating earthquake. We know uh, our thoughts are with all those who have been affected by it. We are looking at the situation. We do stand ready to provide assistance for urgent humanitarian needs if requested. So the Government will do what is necessary and uh, we will stand ready to help people. I also join with him in offering condolences to the family and friends of Carl Sargent. And I'm sure that goes for everybody across this whole House. Now, he raised the issue of crime and policing. In fact, crimes traditionally measured by the Independent Crime Survey are down by well over a third since 2010. We have been protecting police budgets. We've protected police budgets. And we're putting more money into counter-terrorism policing. But what matters is what the police do and how they deliver. And as I say, the crime survey shows that crime is down by nearly a third since 2010. Mr Speaker, I've been following some of the tweets from some of her friends along the front bench over there. And one of them, and I quote, says, very disappointed and mystified at the closure of Uxbridge Police Station. (laughs) And... um, And... uh, Just for the, want of, for the want of any doubt, Mr Speaker, uh, that came from the Foreign Secretary, who is also... To hear about the Uxbridge Police Station. Jeremy yeah. Corbyn. Yeah. Well, I'm very pleased you do, Mr Speaker, because the Foreign Secretary is so excited he won't even hear the answer. 
the real reason, Mr. Speaker, is that it's closing because of a 2.3 billion cut from police budgets in the last Parliament. And it gets worse; they're going to be cut by another 700 million by 2020. Mr. Speaker, under this government, there are il- there are 11,000 fewer firefighters in England since 2010. And last year, deaths in fires increased by 20%. In the wake of the terrible Grenfell Tower fire, the Prime Minister was actually very clear that she said this could not be allowed to happen again and money would be no object to fire safety. Will she therefore now back the campaign to provide £1 billion to local councils to retrofit sprinklers in all high-rise blocks. Prime Minister! Well, first of all, on the first question that the Right Honourable Gentleman raised, the first issue that he raised, he might not have noticed, but the Police and Crime Commissioner in London is the Mayor. I looked, Sadiq Khan was a Labour mayor of London. <laughs> although, although perhaps, but perhaps the leader of the Labour Party thinks he's not Labour enough for him and his brand of Labour. Uh, uh, but let's be, let's be very clear. Let's be very clear about funding for the Metropolitan Police. There's more money and more officers for each Londoner than anywhere else in the country. That's the reality about funding for the Metropolitan Police. Now, he asks, he has asked about the issue of fire, and we absolutely take what happened, the appalling tragedy of what happened at Grenfell Tower, seriously, and that's why I set up the public inquiry. It's why my right honourable friend, the Community Secretary, has set up already in work taking place on the fire regulations and the building regulations to ensure that we do have those right. And it's why we continue to support Kensington and Chelsea Council in ensuring that we deliver for those who have been victims of this awful tragedy. But he asks about, he asks about sprinklers. And of course, we do want to make sure that homes are fit for those who live in them. There is a responsibility on building owners in relation to that. And some owners do retrofit sprinklers, but there are other safety measures that can take place. But perhaps he ought to look at what Labour councils have said about this. Haringey Council rejected calls to fit sprinklers, saying what matters is introducing the right safety measures. Lewisham councils say they need to weigh up the issues because fitting sprinklers can involve cutting through fire compartmentalisation, which is another safety measure. Lambeth Council said there were issues retrofitting sprinklers and questions about how effective they were. Even Islington Council say they need to look at how effective sprinklers would be. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, (coughs) the coroner after Lacknell House thought that fitting sprinklers would be a right thing to do. The chief fire officer thinks it's a right thing to do. Those local authorities that have asked central government those local authorities that have asked central government for support to retrofit sprinklers have all been refused by her government. Surely we need to think about the safety of the people living in socially rented high-rise blocks. Yesterday, I was passed a letter, Mr Speaker, from a lettings agency in Lincolnshire, where universal credit is about to be rolled out. The agency, and I have the letter here, the agency is issuing all of its tenants with a preemptive notice of eviction because universal credit has driven up arrears where it's been rolled out. And the letter, and I quote, says, the letter says, and I quote, GAP property cannot sustain arrears at the potential levels universal credit could create. Will the Prime Minister pause universal credit so it can be fixed, or does she think it is right to put thousands of families through Christmas in the 
trauma of knowing they're about to be evicted because they're in rent arrears because of universal credit. Prime Minister! Can I say to the right honourable gentleman that there have been concerns raised, there have been concerns raised in this House previously over the issue of people managing their budgets to pay rent. But what we actually see, what we see is that over uh, what we see that after four months, the number of people on universal credit in arrears has fallen by a third. Now, it's important that we do look at the issues on this uh, particular case. Now, the right honourable gentleman uh, might like to send the uh, letter through. I know in an earlier uh, Prime Minister's questions, he raised a specific constituency, a specific case of an individual who'd written to him about her, her experience on universal credit. I think it was Georgina. As far as I'm aware, he has so far not sent that letter to me, despite the fact that I asked. Mr Speaker, I am very happy to give the Prime Minister a copy of this letter. I suspect it's not the only letting agency that's sending out that kind of letter. She might be aware that food bank usage has increased by 30% in areas where universal credit has been rolled out. Three million families are losing an average of 2,500 a year through uh, universal credit. The Child Poverty Action Group estimates more than a million will be in poverty due to cuts imposed by universal credit. If those aren't reasons enough to pause the rollout, I don't know what there are. And Mr Speaker, last week, last week, the Chief Executive... Order, 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 order. Mr Morris, calm yourself. Behave with restraint. You're seated in a prominent position. Quiet. It will be good for your well-being. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Chief Executive of NHS England, Simon Stevens, wrote, the budget for the NHS next year is well short of what is currently needed. A&E waiting time target hasn't been met for two years. The 62-day cancer waiting time target hasn't been met since 2015. So again, can the Prime Minister spend the next week ensuring that the budget does give sufficient funding to our NHS to meet our people's needs? The Prime Minister. First of all, on the first issue that the Right Honourable Gentleman raised, can I remind him yet again Universal credit is ensuring that we are seeing more people in work and able to keep what they earn. He talks about what Simon Stevens says about the National Health Service. Yes, let's look at what Simon Stevens says about the National Health Service. The quality of NHS care is demonstrably improving. Outcomes of care for most major conditions are dramatically better than three or five or ten years ago. He said, what's been achieved in England over the past three years? More convenient access to primary care services. First steps to expand the primary care workforce. Highest cancer survival rates ever. Big expansion in cancer checkup. Public satisfaction with hospital uh, inpatients at its highest for more than two decades. That's the good news of our National Health Service. Well, it's very strange, Mr. Speaker. Very strange, Mr. Speaker, that the chief executive of NHS providers says we're in the middle of the longest and deepest financial squeeze in history. I've got a pretty good idea they know what they're talking about. Let me give the Prime Minister another statistic. The number of people waiting more than four hours in A&E has gone up by 557% since 2010. Two weeks ago, Mr Speaker, the opposition to us, the Tories over there, were very noisy when I mentioned... You are the government, we're the opposition, you're in opposition to us. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. But if I... Two weeks ago, Mr Speaker, I raised the question of cuts in school budgets. Teachers and parents telling MPs what the reality of it was about. The Prime Minister was in denial. Every Tory MP was in denial. This week, 
5,000 head teachers from 25 counties wrote to the Chancellor saying, we are simply asking for the money that is being taken out of the system to be returned. Will the Prime Minister listen to head teachers and give a commitment that the budget next week will return the money to school budgets so that our schools are properly funded? Prime Minister! Well, can I say to the right honourable gentleman, actually I think this is a major moment. He has got something right today. We are the government and he is the opposition. NHS, there are 1,800 more patients seen within the four-hour A&E standard every single day compared to 2010. And he talks about school funding. We are putting more money into uh, our school budget. We are seeing record levels of funding going into our schools. And this, this government is the first government in decades that has actually gripped the issue of a fairer national funding formula. And we are, putting that, we are putting that into practice. But you can only put record levels of, of money into your NHS and your schools with a strong economy. And what do we see, what do we see as, the, as the result of policies that this Conservative government has put into place? Income inequality, down under the Conservatives, up under Labour. Unemployment, down under the Conservatives, up under Labour. Workless households, down under the Conservatives, up under Labour. Deficit, down under the Conservatives, up under Labour. He's planning a run on the pound. We're building a Britain fit for the future. Mr Speaker, I would have thought that uh, 5,000 five thousand head teachers would have a pretty good idea about the funding problems of their schools and a pretty good idea of the effect of government cuts on school budgets on their staff and on their students. Indeed the IFS says that school funding will have fallen by five percent in real terms by 2019 as a result of government policies. Mr Speaker Public services in crisis, from police to the fire service, from NHS to children's schools, while a super rich few dodge their taxes. Ah, oh, yes. The government sits on its hands as billions are lost to vital public services. The Conservatives cut taxes for the few and vital services for the many. It's not just that there's one rule for the super rich. Order, order. I apologise for interrupting the right honourable gentleman. Both sides of this House will be heard. And the idea that when somebody's asking a question, there should be a concerted attempt to shout that person down is totally undemocratic and completely unacceptable from whichever quarter it comes. And I would just ask colleagues to give some thought to how our behaviour is regarded by the people who put us here. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, quite simply, isn't the truth that this is a government that protects the super-rich while the rest of us pick up the bill through cuts, austerity, poverty, homelessness, low wages and slashing of local services all over the country. That is the reality of a Tory government. Prime Minister. We have taken £160 billion extra in as a result of the action we have taken on tax avoidance and evasion. The tax gap is now at its lowest level ever. If the tax gap had stayed at the level it was under the Labour Party, we would be losing the equivalent of the entire police budget for England and Wales. We, in the Conservatives, are building a Britain that is fit for the future. The best Brexit deal, more high-paid jobs, better schools, the homes our country needs. Labour have backtracked on Brexit. They've gone back on their promise on student debt and they would cause and lose control of public finances. I say to the right honourable gentleman, he may have given momentum to his party but he brings stagnation to the country. Thank, thank 
Thank you, thank you Mr Speaker. Um, in April 2015, the residents of Brownsover saw their only GP surgery close in an area of rugby that once had significant challenges, but thanks to the great work of local councillors has been regenerated. My constituents reluctantly accepted short-term pain for the long-term game of a new surgery that would open the following summer. And regrettably, the project still hasn't yet started, so I wonder whether the Prime Minister might meet with me and Browns Over Patients Action Group to consider the slippage in this much-needed facility. It is too long. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend is right to raise this important issue for his constituents, and I have been assured in this particular case that all the local health organisations do remain fully committed to this project. They are confident it will bring benefits to the local population in the long term, but I fully understand the frustration that my honourable friend has at the delays that have taken place. I, I understand he is going to be meeting representatives of NHS England and NHS NHS property services later this month. It's those two organisations that can uh, best place, they're in the best position to ensure that this project is progressed as quickly as possible. And I hope that there will be some positive news coming out of that, uh, of that meeting. But as my honourable friend has raised the issue of access to local health services, Mr Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity as well to say how important it is. This is no, this is an important issue for ev- people around this House and outside of this House. Health services, I want to make sure that everybody that is entitled to a flu jab this year goes and gets one. I have had one as a type 1 diabetic, and I hope everyone in this House is encouraging their constituents who are entitled to those flu jabs to get them. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister and the leader of the Labour Party in congratulating the Queen and Prince yeah, Philip for yeah. the impending yeah. platinum anniversary of their, of their wedding? Can I also, I'm sure the House would want to join me in welcoming the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament yeah. who is yeah. in the gallery today? Does the Prime Minister agree with me that we should be incredibly proud of our emergency services, that they do a heroic job, often putting themselves in danger to keep us all safe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, can I uh, join the uh, right honourable gentleman in welcoming the presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament to see uh, our proceedings today? And I, as I have said uh, previously in this chamber, I am happy to confirm that our emergency services do do an amazing job. I was very pleased at the Pride of Britain Awards to be awarding uh, uh, the uh, posthumously awarding an award in the name of uh, PC Keith Palmer, who of course worked to keep this place safe. But other police officers, the uh, Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Liberal Democrats, uh, gave uh, uh, awards to other police officers who had also done what they do and other emergency services do. They run towards danger when most of us would run away from it. Ian Blackford. I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister. However, Mr Speaker, Scottish Fire and Police are the only forces in the United Kingdom to be charged VAT, depriving frontline services of £140 million since 2013. The SNP has now raised this issue 30 times in this chamber. Will the UK Government now give Scotland's emergency services back at £140 million and scrap the VAT? This has been a long-standing SNP campaign. We will not give up. Prime Minister. Minister. Right, honourable gentlemen, as the, the Chief Secretary has made clear that officials in HMT will look at this uh, issue and they'll report on it in due course, I'm pleased to say that very constructive representations have been made by my Scottish colleagues on the Conservative on this, uh, on this particular issue. But, but let's, let's just be clear, because, because the right honourable gentleman knows this, that the, before the Scottish Government made the decision to make Scotland's police and fire services national rather than regional bodies. They were told that this would mean that they would become ineligible for VAT refunds, and they pressed ahead despite knowing that. Oliver Dowden! Grandparents have a vital role to play in the upbringing of their grandchildren. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something that at a time of rising life expectancy they are better equipped than ever to fulfil. 
Does the Prime Minister therefore agree with me that we should send a strong signal from this House, not only that there should be a presumption in their favour when it comes to adoption, but they should also be intimately involved in those decisions, something that I have seen has been sadly lacking in my own constituency? Well, can I say to my honourable friend that, uh, like him, I have seen grandparents in my constituency, through my constituency surgery, who have been concerned about decisions uh, that have been taken in relation to their grandchildren when they themselves were willing to provide that home and support for them. So he has raised a very important issue. There is, of course, already a duty on local authorities in legislation to ensure that, wherever possible, children are raised within their family, and the statutory guidance does make particular reference to grandparents. But adoption agencies must also consider the needs of the child first and foremost. Each case will be different, but I think the message he's giving of grand, uh, grandchildren being able to be brought up in their family, wherever possible, is a good one. Drew Hendry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had the Prime Minister accepted my invitation to the Universal Credit Summit in Inverness, she would have heard harrowing testimony from constituents and multiple agencies alike, including Macmillan Cancer Cab Partnership, who told not only of patients dying whilst awaiting their payments, but they are now forced to self-declare that they are dying even if they didn't want the doctor to tell them their fate. Will she stop this wait and end this cruel condition? Prime Minister. I've made the point earlier about the importance of universal credit. We have made changes in the implementation of it, and we are listening to the concerns that are being raised. We are making more advanced payments available. But the Honourable Gentleman might also like to uh, uh, recognise that, thanks to the unprecedented devolution of powers to Scotland that we have uh, given, including over welfare, The Scottish Government have the ability to take a different path if they wish to. So action in Holyrood might be there. Michael Tomlinson. Uh, th- thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, we're leaving the European Union. Yeah. And, yeah. and as the EU withdrawal bill goes through the House of Commons, does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's part of our job as Members of Parliament, some might even say it's our duty as Members of Parliament, to scrutinise that legislation, yeah. to debate considered amendments which seek to improve the Bill and which are constructive and which seek to ensure a smooth transition of our laws from the EU to the UK, and importantly, that we come together and deliver Brexit for our country and for the British people. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, my my hon. Friend is right. We will be leaving the European Union on the 29th of March 2019. And there is, of course, a lively debate going on in this place, and that's right and proper, and that's important. Uh, and there are strong views held on different sides of, this ar- of the argument about the European Union uh, on both sides of this House. Uh, what we are doing as a government is listening to the contributions that are being made. We are listening carefully to those who wish to improve the bill, and I hope that we can all come together to deliver on the decision that the country took that we should leave the European Union. Yeah, yeah. Carolyn Harris. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. It's been almost a year since I stood in this chamber, told my personal story, and asked for a children's funeral fund to be established. The Leader of the House recently expressed her sympathy for such a fund. And I have written to the Chancellor and I have urged him to include such a fund in next week's budget. Will the Prime Minister add her voice to mine and ask her Chancellor to make this provision a reality? The the Honourable Lady has been a passionate campaigner on this issue and has has, um, very thoughtfully shared her own personal experience with this House. And uh, we recognise what an incredibly painful experience it is to lose a child. And I know that the whole House uh, are in sympathy with those who do experience such a tragedy each year. Sadly, thousands of families do that. Now... What has happened is that the cross, we have put, put in place a piece of cross-government work to look at this whole question of how we can improve support for bereaved parents in a whole variety of ways. That piece of work is being led by my honourable friend, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Youth Justice. We are already supporting the private member's bill on parental bereavement that my honourable friend, the member for Thurston Morton, has introduced. We are making it easier for parents to apply for financial support. And we are also ensuring that support from across government is brought together so it's easily accessible for bereaved parents at what we know is a very difficult time. Nigel Mills. Will the Prime Minister join me in praising the work that 
A community transport provider is like a CT for TC in Amber Valley, a provider right across the country. And can she intervene to sort out the threat to the permits they use as not-for-profit providers that threatens uh, their services going forward? And in the meantime, can she issue guidance that confirms there is no need for local councils to take enforcement action until that consultation is complete? Prime Minister! Well, I, we do strongly believe community transport operators do provide vital services connecting people and communities and reducing isolation. I was very pleased to visit um, a number of weeks ago to actually visit and take a ride on one of the community buses that is provided within uh, the Wokingham Borough that, that services part of my constituency. Um, the Department of Transport does remain committed to supporting community transport operators, has no intention of ending the permit system, and to support this, DFT has recently written to all local authorities in Great Britain to explain how they can comply with the regulations without negatively impacting on operators and passengers. Progress is excessively slow. Let's try to speed up. Stephen Gethins. Mr. Speaker, um, the Prime Minister, I know, is aware that BIFAB, a firm that supplies the energy sector, um, is, has, might enter administration. This would put 1,400 jobs in Fife, Lewis and elsewhere in Scotland under threat. Can I ask the Prime Minister to work with BIFAB, its workforce, the Scottish Government and Fife Council to do all they can and what specific actions you can take? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to give the Honourable Gentleman that assurance. I was able to discuss this matter very briefly with the First Minister of Scotland yesterday when I met her, and I'm pleased to say um, that uh, my Honourable Friend, the Member for Devizes, as a, as a Minister in Bays, spoke to uh, the relevant Minister in the Scottish Government, Paul Williamson, yesterday about this uh, about this issue, and we stand ready. Uh, Bays, uh, HMT, and the government stand ready to work with the Scottish government and others to try to ensure that the best result can be achieved. Donnellan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our NHS is a national treasure, and we must be bold to protect it. Each week, my constituents struggle to get an appointment to their doctors, whilst our fantastic doctors are stretched to the limit and practices are struggling to recruit. To safeguard our NHS, will the Prime Minister look at making medical students sign a contract, committing them to working within the NHS for the first five years, yeah. stopping the brain drain of our newly qualified doctors overseas? Well, this, this is uh, an important issue, and uh, my honourable friend is right. We do need more GPs. That's why we're increasing the number of places at medical schools by uh, 1,500, and the first 500 of those will be available next September. On the specific point that she raises about committing people who have been trained uh, to uh, work in the NHS, this is the uh, Department of Health has been looking at ways in which we can maximise our investment in medical education, and they've asked Health Education England to look at the precise point that she's raised and to report back early next year. Gray. To speak, the Foreign Secretary told this House he'd seen no evidence of Russian interference in UK elections and the referendum. Yet on Monday, the Prime Minister warned Russia not to meddle in Western democracies, and today the Times reports that fake Russian Twitter accounts churned out thousands of messages in an attempt to influence the EU referendum result. Has the Foreign Secretary not been kept in the dark on the intelligence? Has he not read it or is he willfully blind? And will she now stop dragging her feet and set up the Intelligence and Security Committee to look urgently into the Kremlin's attempts to undermine our democracy? Minister. The Honourable Lady is right that I spoke, on, I spoke on Monday about the issue of Russian interference in elections. We have seen that in a number of countries, taking place in a number of countries in Europe. Well, it's all very well Labour members pointing to the Foreign Secretary. He made a specific point about what was happening here in the United Kingdom. And if they let, care to look at the speech I gave on Monday, they will see that the examples I gave of Russian interference were not in the United Kingdom. But she raises the issue about the Intelligence and Security Committee, and it is being established today. Get Malt House. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Speaker, the harmful aspects of the internet are now causing a series of social policy emergencies, particularly amongst young people. While parents across the country will welcome the engagement of the Home Secretary with the industry on these issues, could the Prime Minister tell us when we can expect legislation with real teeth that recognises that our children only have one chance at childhood? 
Yeah. Prime Minister. I say, my honourable friend, I know, has taken a particular interest in this issue and ensuring that we are giving the support and security and safety for young people on the internet that, as he says, is so necessary. Um, we are considering a range of options in, on this issue. Later this month, we will, uh, sorry, last month, we published our internet safety strategy. We are consulting on a number of measures like a social media code of practice, social media levy, and transparency reporting. But we do need to take action to protect internet users, especially young people, and that includes considering a sanctions regime to ensure compliance, as we indeed said in our party manifesto. Mary Rimmer. Speaker. Prime Minister, in the past month, both Adam Ellison and Tommy Grace have been fatally stabbed in Prescott in my constituency. This is part of an increase in violent crime of 20% in the last year. Since 2009, Merseyside Police has lost over 1,700 frontline staff. That includes over 1,000, that's more than one in five, police officers. 82 million have been cut to now, with a further 18 for 21 to 22. How will you, Prime Minister, use the budget to address the public's rightful expectation of more police on the street? Merseyside budget has not been protected. Can I say, first of all, to the Honourable Lady, that of course I am sure the sympathies of the whole House and the thoughts of the whole House are with those who have been so uh, injured and, and stabbed in the way that the Honourable Lady has referred to. And of course, we are concerned about uh, criminal acts of this sort that, uh, that take place. The question, as I said, uh, I've said earlier in other answers, we have been protecting police budgets. We have protecting police budgets, and of course, we do see a higher percentage of police officers now actually on the front line. Paul Masterton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In July 2016, a 20-year-old man called Samuel Cioni arrived in Barhead from Romania. Three weeks later, in broad daylight, he held a shard of glass to the throat of a 14-year-old schoolgirl, forced her into bushes outside a local supermarket and raped her. Last week, he was sentenced to nine years in prison. Can the Prime Minister explain what this government is doing to stop dangerous individuals like Samuel Cioni entering our country? And can she assure my constituents that Brexit will not result in the weakening or undermining of the security cooperation with our partners in the EU? I say to my Prime friend, he, he also raises an absolutely appalling and horrific crime, and I know that the thoughts of members across the House are with the victim and her family. Uh, I can assure him that in this specific case, the Home Office will be pursuing deportation action against the individual. Uh, the, I understand he met my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, and she will be writing to him with details uh, further uh, shortly. Uh, he makes a wider point, though, about the continued work that we will have and partnership and cooperation we'll have with with the EU27 once we've left the European Union. I'm very clear, as I was in my Florence speech, that we want to maintain that, that cooperation on security and uh, on criminal justice and law enforcement matters. It's important to us all. Stephen Lloyd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Child Poverty Action Group recently published some figures that showed, as a consequence of the cuts to universal credit and the benefits freeze, single parents with children stand to lose, on average, £2,380 per annum exactly from the so. family. Exactly I would so. ask the Prime Minister, when she was sitting down with her government ministers, uh, planning an absolute evisceration of single parents and families, whether today she feels a sense of shame. We're grateful. Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I've, uh, as I've said in answer to a number of questions on universal credit, I believe that the introduction of universal credit is very important in helping people get into work, helping more people get into work, and also in ensuring that people can earn more of what they pay. Of course, we look at the implementation and the impact that implementation is having. As I've said, we have made a number of changes in the way it's being implemented. But universal credit is self, itself is the right thing to do because it is enabling more people to get into the workplace and helping them when they're in the workplace. Zach Goldsmith. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. With, um, with recent events in Zimbabwe and, and total electoral chaos now in Kenya, will the Prime Minister join me in celebrating the hugely successful elections this week in Somaliland? Yes. And with direct help from this country, from our government, the National Election Commission in that country has conducted a template election described by the International Observer Mission as peaceful, transparent, fair and totally uncontested. Yeah, yeah. What's more, the winning candidate has announced that one of his first acts will be to legislate against FGM as a direct consequence of work by a campaign, yeah. British campaigner, yeah. Nimco Ali, who deserves yeah. this house. Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. My, my honourable friend raises an important issue. This government is uh, pleased at the work that we have done to support the government in Somalia to ensure that we can see those uh, elections taking place in the way that my honourable friend has said, and we continue to do that. I was pleased myself to uh, uh, chair the Somalia conference that, we, that took place here earlier this, uh, this year, and I am very pleased to hear of the uh, intention to deal with the issue of female genital mutilation. This is an important issue that is raised by a mem- number of members across this House. We want, to see, we want to see it dealt with not just in Somalia, but here in the United Kingdom as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, a couple in my constituency have had their application for universal credit delayed because the mum doesn't have any photo ID. She can't afford a passport and she doesn't drive. So they now have to wait for both her dentist and her doctor to provide identification. Now, with all the other chaos of universal credit, will the Prime Minister step in, show some common sense and transfer legacy identification from legacy benefits over to universal credit so these unnecessary delays don't pr- don't give my constituents more pain and suffering. Yeah. Yeah. Can I say to the lady that I'm sure that she will appreciate that it is important in dealing with these benefits that we ensure that it is those who are entitled to them who are receiving them. Uh, and uh, we do look and continue to look at how we are implementing uh, universal universal credit. And I'm sure that if she would cares to write with the point that she is making to the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, he will look at it. Charlie Elphick. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Businesses in, uh, at the Dover front line are now preparing to leave the European Union. Will the government consider earmarking at least a billion pounds in the upcoming budget to make sure that we are ready on day one, deal or no deal, and prepared for every single eventuality? Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend for his question. Obviously, in his constituency, this issue of preparations for the position when we leave the European Union is very, uh, very uh, uh, tightly uh, felt, and there's great focus on it. And I appreciate why that is the case. Um, we have already made funds available for the uh, preparations and work that is necessary across government in preparations for Brexit. And of course, we will be looking at what further uh, work is necessary to ensure that we are ready. Uh, we hope we're going to get that good deal, and we're working to get that good deal. But either way, there will need to be some changes from the government point of view, and we're ensuring that the resources are there to do that. Sir Vincent Cable. Yesterday, the uh, Brexit Secretary gave a pledge in the city that freedom of movement would be preserved for bankers and other members of the financial services industry. Uh, why can't the same pledge be given to other key economic sectors like manufacturing and agriculture? We have, Prime Minister. Uh, as we look towards the immigration rules that will be introduced once we leave the European Union, we are very clear about the need to ensure that we take into account the needs of our economy. That is precisely why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has asked the Independent Migration Advisory Committee to look at this issue and make recommendations to the Government. James Dudridge. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Given the re- recent events in Zimbabwe, what support can Her Majesty's Government uh, provide to Zimbabweans to help their country's recovery, both economically but also in terms of their democratic systems of government? Prime Minister. My honourable friend raises an important point, as we have all seen the, uh, what has been taking place in Harare. We are monitoring those developments very carefully. The situation is still fluid, um, and we would urge restraint on all sides, because we want to see and we would call for an avoidance of violence. Of course, our primary concern is the safety of British nationals in Zimbabwe, and uh, that our 
obviously in an uncertain political situation. We do see reports of unusual military activity, so we would recommend British nationals in Harare to remain safely at home until the situation becomes clearer. But on the point my honourable friend has specifically raised, we are currently providing bilateral support to Zimbabwe of over £80 million per year, and part of this is to support economic reform and development, just as he says. Mr. Powell. Uh, Next week will mark six months since the tragic attack at the Manchester Arena. Will the Prime Minister join me in once again paying tribute to all of those who responded so brilliantly to the aftermath? The Prime Minister will also be aware that the costs associated with this attack, uh, now imposed on the city, are well in excess of £17 million, costs which the Government agreed to meet. Yet, as of today, these monies have yet to be reimbursed. Would she today give a clear and categoric commitment that these monies will be reimbursed at the earliest opportunity? Prime Minister! First of all, can I say to the Honourable Lady that our thoughts continue to be with those, uh, all of those who were affected by this terrible attack that took place in Manchester. I myself, as well as meeting some of the victims immediately after the attack, I also met some of the victims and those who were involved um, a, a matter of weeks ago and talked to them about the long-lasting impact that this has on them. And uh, she has raised an important issue. What I can say to her is, in relation to this funding issue, we'll be responding in full by the end of next week. Um, but I would expect that response to confirm that the majority of funds will be made available. Mrs. Theresa Villiers. As I do in Barnet, the Prime Minister represents a constituency in the Greenbelt. So will she assure the House that the government she leads will never weaken protection for the Greenbelt? Prime Minister. We've, we've been very clear about our position in, uh, on, in relation to the Greenbelt. And uh, indeed, we, have, uh, we confirmed that in the housing white paper that we set out, where we were very clear about that too. We do want to see more homes being built in this country. It's important that we see more homes being built, particularly in London. Um, but there are many uh, opportunities to do that which don't affect the Greenbelt. Angela Eagle. Mr Speaker, earlier in the year the Prime Minister told the country that she was the only person that could offer strong and stable leadership in the national interest. With her cabinet crumbling before her eyes. Can she tell us how it's going? <laughs> Prime Minister. Let me, uh, let me say to the Right Honourable Lady what we see this Government delivering. I've spoken about some of the things earlier. Deficit down, unemployment down. Uh, uh, we've seen more record sums going to our health service and our schools. And a Government determined, with a clear plan, as set out in my Florence speech, a clear plan to deliver the best Brexit deal for this country. She's a member of a party that can't even decide what it wants from Brexit, let alone set a plan for it. John Barron! No serious negotiation would normally allow one side to try to dictate financial terms before the wider terms were known. In preparing to embrace uh, the world when it comes to trade through WTO rules, will she please ignore the siren voices and defeatist voices who, who got Project Fear 1 wrong and our need to join the Euro wrong? Well, can I say to my honourable friend, what we want to do is to negotiate a good, close uh, partnership, a special partnership with the remaining EU27, so that we can continue to see good trade as far as possible, tariff-free and fri- as frictionless as possible between companies here in the United Kingdom and those in the EU27. But we also want, as he indicates, to have trade deals around the rest of the world to ensure that we are taking the advantages of the opportunities those trade deals give, because it means more prosperity and more jobs here in the UK. Tansing Desi. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, being good neighbours, the Prime Minister and I from Maidenhead and Slough, I'd like to first of all place on record my immense gratitude to the Prime Minister and indeed half of her cabinet for having come to my aid recently to help increase our majority from seven to seventeen thousand. Yeah. Yeah. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, Mr Speaker, constituents, businesses and unions in my constituency feel very aggrieved that various government announced initiatives have seen little or no progress. The uh, electrification of the train line between Slough and Windsor has now been deferred. Order, or, or, order, or, order. I am trying to be accommodating to colleagues and I want to hear the honourable gentleman. But the rest of the question must be just that. One sentence and a question mark at the end of it. 
Mr. The Speaker, the could money? the Prime Minister please assuage the concerns of my constituents and reassure them that the Western Rail link to, uh, to Heathrow will be treated as a priority matter so that it is dealt with immediately? Thank you. Thank you. The Prime Minister. I'm, I'm pleased to say to the uh, honourable gentleman that we are putting significant sums of money into transport infrastructure, into rail infrastructure. Crucially, of course, we are electrifying the Great Western Main Line, which will be of benefit to Slough and to Maidenhead. Finally, Ian Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister join me in welcoming the decision by the people of Australia? Uh, to vote in favour of same-sex marriage, and does she share my hope that the Government of Australia will quickly legislate uh, to introduce it and follow the lead set by this House? I am very happy to join my honourable friend in welcoming that vote in Australia. I was proud, as I know he and other colleagues were, when we passed the legislation here in this House to enable uh, same-sex marriage here in the United Kingdom, and I hope the Australian Government will indeed take that uh, vote and move, act on it very soon. Thank you. Order.